Welcome. My name is Andy Lundeen, the Associate Editor for The Hearing Review. For this episode of Hearing Horizons, I'm happy to be joined by Dr. Marshall Chasen, an audiologist who is the Director of Audiology and Research at the Musicians Clinics of Canada, an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto in Linguistics, and an Associate Professor in the School of Communication Disorders and Sciences at Western University. Dr. Chasen holds a Bachelor of Science in Theoretical Mathematics and Computational Linguistics from the University of Toronto, a Master of Science degree in Audiology and Speech Sciences from the University of British Columbia, and a Doctor of Audiology degree from the Arizona School of Health Sciences. Today we'll discuss how tinnitus affects musicians in differing age demographics. Welcome, Marshall, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Andy. Glad to be here. Great. Thank you so much. Um, And yeah, to start things off, I just wanted to bring up a quote in a recent article you wrote for the January issue of The Hearing Review, which addressed music and stress. So I'll just read that off here. While it is important to provide and verify the best uniform version of hearing protection that will not alter the characteristics of music, it is also important to bring issues related to stress into the question. And this is especially true for clinical complaints of bothersome tinnitus. It is incorrect to assume that the tinnitus experienced by a 75-year-old person with a significant hearing loss is the same tinnitus that a 20-year-old experiences with essentially normal peripheral auditory function. And so it, it makes sense to me, obviously, that tinnitus experienced by an older musician, someone in their 70s, would be different than someone in their 20s, of course, uh, since I, I think it's fair to say that the older folks would generally have more professional music experience. I guess I just broadly wanted to uh, ask you some, what are some of the key distinctions and symptoms of tinnitus for older musicians when compared to younger musicians? Older musicians have had to uh, uh, fight with presbycusis, the fact that they're older, and that's inevitable. Hopefully it's inevitable because the opposite is not very good. Um, But they also have some noise exposure from their music, but also they may have a day job that is particularly noisy as well. So they have a whole lifetime of recreational and occupational and musical noise exposure to deal with. And they're in their 70s or 80s. So they're going to have, in most cases, a significant higher frequency um, sensorineural uh, hearing loss, a loss of not only only the sensitivity of the right-hand side of the piano keyboard, but a loss in the specificity uh, of the tuning uh, and sometimes distortion in the right-hand side of the piano keyboard. Associated with that, commonly found is indeed complaints or comments of tinnitus. Tinnitus, we do know, is due to a neuroplasticity change, a, a re wiring, as it were, of the auditory cortex in the brain caused by this peripheral loss. So there's difficulty for a certain signal to get up to the brain. The brain cells essentially said, well, I'm going to generate that sound anyway, uh, because I don't hear it. And there is some neurological um, changes that go on in the brain. It's almost as if you've turned up the volume control or the amplifier of the brain. We sometimes call this central gain. And that's the typical type of tinnitus that you read about in the literature where uh, it's associated with hearing loss. And we, in fact, find that hearing aids can significantly reduce the complaints of tinnitus in the majority of patients, anywhere between 50 and 60% of patients significantly find that a hearing aid helps to assist them in the bothering effects of tinnitus. And that's well defined in the in the literature. However, it's incorrect to assume that someone who's in their 20s is who also complains of tinnitus, has the same um, physiology, the same anatomy of what's going on in their brain. In most cases, these uh, people have peripheral normal hearing as far as we can measure it. They may have some slight neural deficits uh, caused by probably 5, 10, or even 15 years at that age of music or noise exposure. But in most cases, it's usually related at that age to stress and not a neuroplasticity or a change in the brain. We didn't know a lot about the effects of stress on the auditory mechanism until around 2009 and 2010. Two very important articles came into the literature, and unfortunately they were not in the uh, audiology literature, they were in the cell biology literature and the physiology literature. And essentially what it says is that there's a mechanism called excitotoxicity, 
technically it's called glial uh, t uh, excitotoxicity. And the way this works is that when you are stressed, the adrenal glands on your kidneys emit a very strong level or high level of cortisol, one of the stress hormones. Through uh, some interesting biochemical reactions, cortisol can cross into the brain, and once in the brain, facilitates higher levels of glutamate. Now, we may not have heard of glutamate. We've heard of dopamine and we've heard of serotonin. These are the neural transmitter substances that live in between neurons. But glutamate is the one for our auditory system. High levels of stress results in high levels of cortisol, which results in high levels of glutamate. Glutamate at higher levels is toxic to the ear or toxic to the auditory cortex in the, in the brain. So people that are stressed would, uh, at least at the small molecular level, uh, the ear doesn't know the difference between loud noise and high levels of stress. It ultimately results in calcium ions uh, going into the cell and uh, creating cell death. That's how uh, excital, excitotoxicity works. So the ear doesn't know the difference between loud noise or high levels of stress. Now let's look at a typical 20-year-old or 25-year-old musician. The at least in Canada, the average salary of a 20-year-old musician to 25-year-old full-time gigging musician is around sixteen or $17,000, barely at the subsistence level. Um, they can't always pay their rent. If they live in a large city, rents can be very high. Where's the next meal coming from? That's not black and white. That's not very clear. We live in a society that does not respect musicians and performing artists to the same extent they uh, respect other professions like lawyers and doctors and audiologists, for that matter. Um, so we live in a situation where you really have some environmental stresses on a young musician. You know, how can I pay my rent? Um, you know, will I get paid? Will I be able to afford food? And God forbid if I ever get sick. Uh, and now in Canada, it's a little bit better than, than the United States. But music exposure or being exposed to music as a live performing artist is a very, very stressful thing. And it's through this process that I've just described of glial excitotoxicity that they can experience tinnitus, purely environmental, not because of there's any change or rewiring or neuroplasticity of the auditory cortex in the brain. Gotcha. Great. Do you, uh, is that generally the case? Do you find that um, in, in younger tinnitus cases that it's, it's typically stress? And do you find that might maybe is like an overlooked aspect from the hearing care professional, that specifically? Thank you for that. Most definitely. I think the number one reason a 20 some odd year old musician will come and see me is not because of hearing loss or not because of anything else, but they have tinnitus. And it's tinnitus that is scaring the heck out of them. Uh, they're saying, is my musical career finished? I'm only in my 20s. There's nothing that I could do uh, to, to get rid of this tinnitus. I've read Google and, and I've you know looked at all the chats on the literature. Tinnitus is bothersome. They come in very, very stressed. And a lot of the times I just sit down with them and it's a counseling session. We just sit back. I give them that little educational note about where I think it's coming from and how it's related to stress. It's not just that stress affects your heart and your liver and your kidneys, but also your hearing mechanism. And I tell them essentially to relax. Um, now, it's easy for me to say that, but we do want to develop other mechanisms by which the stress can be reduced. Uh, at the Musicians Clinics in Canada, we are working on trying to develop performance spaces with other groups, not just us, of course, it's everyone together. Uh, we're trying to also advocate for them to have better funding, whether it's in, in the case of Canada, federal or provincial funding or uh, other means to support them whenever we can. Personally, whenever I see a musician, especially of that age group, I would not charge them for the hearing test or the counseling session. Um, I can make my money other ways as an audiologist, but as far as young musicians are concerned, they need all the input or the therapy they can. I do frequently suggest that they do see a psychologist. A psychologist is worth their weight in gold, and some of the stress reduction techniques uh, that you can garner from an interaction with a psychologist is, is 
is is amazing and it will be useful throughout your entire life. We do have several physicians associated with the musicians clinics who are musicians themselves and they also do a lot of counseling with the musicians and it's amazing the number of I'm going to use the phrase musician injuries that we see that are really stress related, uh, tinnitus being one of them. Gotcha. One of my other questions was, uh, you know, how does the treatment for tinnitus differ? Obviously, it's quite different uh, just based on what you're saying. You With the younger musicians, you're kind of going in with more of like a gentler approach, kind of a reassuring sort of sentiment. I think that's probably the biggest distinction. And I, when you're when, when it's older, it's much more, much more diagnostic thorough. <laughs> That that is true. Um, in fact, um, people have commented, both favorably and I suppose unfavorably, depending on their history with with audiologists, that I spend the vast majority of time talking with them and and talking about information giving, and a, a minority of time actually twiddling the dials in the soundproof booth. So working with young musicians is mostly audiology outside the booth, not inside the booth. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, the musical landscape has evolved a lot over the years, um, and it makes me think about how you know musicians who are older didn't do the right uh, hearing precautions, um, do the right safety measures to make sure that you know in the future they wouldn't be developing certain hearing issues um, such as tinnitus. And it, it makes me wonder about are there newer innovations or technologies which address tinnitus in the future for these younger generations? There are a number of techniques and devices that are available that will minimize the effects of music and noise exposure on the musicians in hopes that when they are 60 or 70 years old, they will still have relatively good hearing. Um, and these are these fall into the realm of hearing protection or hearing loss prevention, I guess, is a better way of saying it. Um, since 1988, there's been a number of flat or uniform attenuation earplugs. And imagine putting an earplug or plugging up your ears. You've lost the lower frequency, the left-hand side of the piano keyboard, just a little, little bit. But the whole right-hand side of the piano keyboard, the treble notes, the harmonics, are brought down quite a bit. So music sounds very dull and very uh, as if you're listening to it from another room. Since 1988, uh, that technology uh, has been available in the form of first the ER at a form of earplugs from etymotic research. Uh, the ER-15, which drops the sound from a damaging to a non-damaging level, but essentially with even a slight reduction, that musician can now be exposed 32 times as long before any damage occurs. So we're trying to get earplugs into a musician's ear when they're young. Uh, I'd rather see a 14-year-old musician than a 40-year-old musician in that sense. There are some things also up on stage that can be done to improve the situation. Uh, for example, uh, we, we do know that the in a rock venue or a pop venue, the drummer's left side is the noisiest part of the stage, and that's where the hi-hats are. So he would take his right hand or her right hand with the stick and hit the hi-hat cymbal by their left ear. Of course, I'm much more interested in the drummer's left ear and maintaining their hearing. But if you can take the drummer and move it to the left side of the stage, that means essentially that all the damaging elements that you might be exposed to are farther away from you, as opposed to the drummer being on the right side of the stage or maybe center stage where the hi-hat is adjacent to the lead vocalist or one of the musicians. Another technique which is very useful, uh, and in fact, it's, it, there, there's an article in the latest journal of the Acoustical Society of America in January of 2024 talking about using vibral tactile tricks to delude yourself into thinking that the music is at a lower level than it really is. In other words, rock and roll has to be loud. That is true. But rock and roll does not have to be intense. And it's the subtle difference between loudness, your perception, and the intensity, the thing that actually causes the hearing loss. So if I can delude a musician, I use that word uh, playfully, of course, but if I can delude a musician into thinking that music is sufficiently loud, but at a lower sound level, I've done a good day job at work. One technique is to use what we call a shaker. Uh, these have been around for many years now. Uh, they're hockey puck sized loudspeakers that are placed on the vertical post of a drummer's seat and it's connected through a wire to the audio rack. 
and not only does the drummer hit the drum, but he will feel a tactile vibration response through his rear, right up through his whole body. And boy, when he hits it, he says, oh, that's loud, but it's, it's at a lower sound level. We can also use this same technology with bass players up on stage in a live performance venue. I can bolt them to a one foot, square foot, three quarter inch piece of plywood place it on the floor near the bass player. And when the bass player plays his or her bass, boy, does it sound loud, but it's at a slow, at a lower um, sound level. So again, you've maintained the sense of loudness. Rock and roll has to be loud, but at a much safer, lower level, such that the musician can actually play more effectively. We've also used baffles now, and we didn't do that 20 or 30 years ago, where we actually can uh, isolate certain musicians, such as the drummer and the hi-hat, from the other musicians who are very close to them. Uh, in a classical venue, you can actually snap these uh, baffles onto the rear part of the seat. And as long as they're within seven or eight inches of the musician's ear, that musician will receive significant benefit in terms of the sound attenuation. Not by a lot. Baffles do have their own problems. Uh, but if I can reduce the sound level by a mere three decibels, which nobody can really hear. If I can make something three decibels quieter, that means that that musician can be exposed twice as long. So our auditory system, music or non-musician, is relatively insensitive to subtle changes in sound level or intensity. So if I can say, ah, and I can say, ah, the second one being about three decibels quieter than the first one, that's barely detectable in a, in a loud musical environment, yet the second one is one half the damage. That is, the musician can be exposed twice as long. Great. And there's, a, there's an interesting point you made there um, about you saying that you would like, the, you'd like to see the younger musicians using the noise-canceling earbuds. Uh, do you feel that there's an increasing acceptance among the younger generations generally? Well, definitely. If we can prevent hearing loss earlier on, it prevents more significant hearing loss later on. And that's where they may have age-related or noise or music-related tinnitus. That is true. Uh, the acceptance level is, is skyrocketing. And I wish that audiologists could take credit for that. But alas, it came from outside of our field. So the first uniform or equal attenuation earplug that came out uh, was 1988. Clinically, I did some research in 1990, shortly after they came out, and I tried to convince everyone to use it, and maybe I was, I was indeed successful about one-third of the time. By 1995, it was about two-thirds of the time, and the last time I did the study in the year 2000, well, it was over 20 years ago, but by then, it was about 92%. So there was an improvement from one-third to almost 100%. Am I a better salesman of the idea to use earplugs? I would like to think I was, but it's not. It's people like Pete Townsend of The Who, or in Canada we call it The Whom. That's a Canadian joke. Um, but, but Pete Townsend uh, did have tinnitus. It does have tinnitus. And he was able to go out there. I gave a lot of money to various groups to help publicize the need to protect your hearing. And so now it's cool to wear earplugs. Before Pete Townsend and Brian Adams in Canada and some of the other famous musicians got on board to talk about how it's cool to be safe and cool to be healthy, audiologists at that time were spinning their wheels. Not that we uh, were ineffective, but there's something about a rock and roller, that a famous rock and roller, that can convince a 15-year-old that I can't. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. I went to a, a Queen show last November, and uh, there was a young fellow, a couple rows to the side of me, and he was wearing earplugs. And I was like, "Oh, wow, good for you!" And he was in his teens, so I was, "It's working. It's, it's." I think you know, I think people are aware, and they don't want to um, disrupt their music listening experience. Um, but um, yeah, with that, we're kind of winding down here, and I just wanted to uh, open up the floor for you if there, to let you uh, add anything to the subject, if there's anything that you had in, in mind that we haven't addressed. Uh, I guess a general comment to all my f colleagues and future colleagues that are still perhaps students, working with musicians is not easy. Uh, musicians don't always keep appointments. They uh, can't always afford products and devices that we may recommend them. 
But I've been in this field for more than 40 years. And I think one of the reasons I like to go to work every day and see patients is diversity. One of the elements of diversity is working with groups such as musicians. I'm not saying that would crank your chain. Everyone has their own interest. It might be vestibular. But seek out an area, if you're especially a, you are a young hearing healthcare professional, and run with it. Uh, in my case, it was musicians. I'm not saying that's for everyone, but seek out something such that when you can look back on your career, kind of a selfishly look back on your career after 40 or 50 years, you'll say, yeah, I, I made a difference and I enjoy going to work every day. Great. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your insights into this topic, Marshall. And I want to thank the listeners as well. For more great content from The Hearing Review, visit us online at hearingreview.com. And while you're there, subscribe to our publications and our newsletters. Marshall, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, Andy.